Good evening for anyone joining the webinar already. We are going to wait about five minutes before we start just to give some extra time for everyone to well connect. Thank you for your patience. Good evening again for anyone who's connected. Just a reminder that we will be starting this webinar at 8.05. Just enough time to give people time to connect. Thank you. Hello again, just a reminder, we will be starting at 8.05 in order to give everyone a chance to connect properly. Thank you, thank you again. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. My name is Tanya D'Alessio, and I am the Yalde School principal. Um, Yalde School is a special needs school in the greater Montreal area, and we service children from 4 to 21 years old uh, with a moderate to severe intellectual delay. 
I would just like to welcome everyone to this evening's Yalde Evolve's latest webinar. For those of you who don't know, uh, Yalde Evolve is a virtual platform that offers educational resources, online therapy, and monthly motivational webinars such as this one this evening. Make sure you go and look at our Yalde Evolve website to find out more information about our future events. You can locate us at yaldeevolve.com. This evening, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Annette Veripilo. Uh, she is the founder of Posture Pro. It's a health company specialized in restoring the brain body connection through some of the world's most advanced rehabilitation and injury prevention techniques. She actually created the uh, Posture Pro method, which has gained global recognition for eliminating chronic pain, optimizing children's development, and improving sports proficiency. So I would like to uh, welcome Annette and thank you very much, Annette, for taking the time to discuss this very, very important uh, initiative you've created. So welcome on behalf of everyone. Thank you so much for the awesome uh, intro, Tanya, and uh, a great thank you to Yaldi for this, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, as you know, we, uh, we met a couple of weeks ago and I expressed my, my passion for the, uh, for the topic, my passion for spreading the knowledge and hopefully this uh, seminar will, uh, or this uh, mini intro or webinar will, will inspire you to look a little bit deeper into, into this brain uh, body con connection. So a little bit about the clinic. It was uh, founded in 2006, Posture Pro. I'm the uh, founder of, um, of uh, Posture Pro, which uh, opened its doors. It's basically one of, the, one of the first clinics or posture clinics, I should say, in Montreal. We're located on uh, Jean Talon corner of Victoria, so right off the carry. And originally I start, started off as a healthcare professional. My main focus was rehabilitation. And in rehab, we are always taught to look at imbalances in the body, imbalances in range of motion, imbalances in movement. Uh, we focus on neck pain, back pain, and all of the, um, how can I say, the popular uh, chronic pains that, that we hear of um, uh, in, in, in the 21st century. So I was really taught to look at um, the, I, I was really taught to look at a problem from a local perspective and not really from, from a global perspective. Uh, quickly, I came to realize that although I was practicing what I was taught and I was providing relief to, to my clients, I came to realize that this relief was only on a temporary basis. And um, I was faced with a question that, that really did challenge me was uh, simply the question was, why is it that this pain just keeps on coming back and how long am I gonna have to come and see you for this problem to go away? This was for, for a shoulder problem. So I, I went back to my teacher, I asked the question, uh, to my great to my great despair, uh, he he had no answer for me. He, I, I guess because he it, it wasn't it was not taught to him when when he studied before he became a teacher. But his answer was, "We don't really care. Just treat the joint and and you know work with the muscles and work with the joint, which is what we were taught in school." And surely enough, this this is what I did. But coming from a family of doctors and and my uncle being a neurosurgeon, I was I have always been fascinated by by the brain and a quick uh, Google search on. Uh, a quick search on Google, how do muscles contract, led me to uh, the answer being the brain, <laughs> which le led me to start looking a little bit more into all of these chronic pains, all of those orthopedic conditions that we, uh, that we see on a daily basis. Just to give you an idea, uh, chronic pain uh, is a $506, $560 billion industry per year. And that basically includes uh, lower back pain, knee pain, ankle pain, migraines, shoulder pain. So that whole, that whole system is really, is really costing us um, a lot of money uh, as far as the healthcare, uh, from the healthcare system is involved. And I think that the problem with these orthopedic symptoms and the reason why they're fail falling through the cracks is because they involve a multiple sensory organ system, which we'll, we'll talk about in this presentation. By multiple sensory organ system, I mean that the body, the human body uses var var uh, a variety of different sources 
to uh, be able to move and organize our movement. And in, in the medical care today, we've divided, we've divided these organ systems into different specialties. And that's why I feel that the methodology of the Pasha Pro method, which incorporates all of those systems into one, uh, it's a method that I've been using for close to 14 years now, is really a holistic assessment that looks at those different organ systems, the eyes, the feet, the jaw scars, brain imbalances, and how the uh, how a human brain develops to begin with. And then we try to apply that concept in the problem that we're faced with in clinic. And um, we, try to, uh, we try to address the symptoms. Um, it, it's, it's, it's more of a personalized treatment, but it always goes back to the nervous system. So um, the, without any further ado, let me, let me connect my presentation, movement development in children. And let's talk about how the nervous system develops and more specifically what that means for you if you have children and if uh, you, you probably already started seeing things and, and you know some of these problems are common, which we tend to think that they're normal, but hopefully I can give you a, a better insight into, into uh, what to look for. So here we go. Let me just connect this here. And you know, if you have any questions or if anything seems a little bit too uh, complex or complicated, feel free to ask the question away. Although I don't have my chat, I may not see the chat. So Tanya, feel free to, to interrupt me. So tonight's presentation is gonna be about movement development in children. I don't know if any of you have heard about uh, primitive uh, reflexes, which are basically movement patterns, but we're gonna cover it up in a specific format. Uh, we're gonna talk about the role and the function of movement, specific primitive movements, uh, what signs you can look for to realize whether or not these reflexes are integrated. Integrated, And I'm going to give you a couple of tips and talk about uh, some, some basic reflexes, but keep in mind that there are 72 movement patterns and I'll explain exactly what those are. Uh, how to test some of those reflexes with your children and uh, simple exercises to facilitate the integration of the reflexes. And uh, of course, how to put all of the chances on your side so that you can have the best results with your clients. Uh, before we start though, a disclaimer that this uh, webinar is not intended to, um, is, is simply for informative reasons. If you feel that there's any serious uh, issue with your child or with yourself, please uh, do consult with a medical doctor or with uh, your healthcare specialist. So, Moving along to what primitive reflexes are, I, I don't know if many of you have heard about it before. I know that when I talk to a lot of therapists, it's not something that's really, that's really looked uh, at. Primitive reflexes are basically these movement patterns that we all have as humans that are generated, or I should say that reside in our primitive brain. You see, as humans, we all have a brain that needs to grow and the growing of that brain is going to be is going to happen through stimulation through sensory stimulation so before we were talking about those sensory receptors that are basically those sensory organs that get information and and that are separated into different segments well those receptors are primarily are the eyes the feet the muscles the joints and certainly the way that their, their role is to tell our brain what's going on in the exterior environment. So for example, an example of a primitive reflex in a baby uh, would be that when you, when you take a newborn child, you simply stroke their hand, they will automatically grab your finger and go into flexion. So that is a reflex. That is a primitive reflex that is completely normal. This is a normal behavior. However, it's not normal if you still have this reflex at three years old, at four years old, or even later on in life. I have some adults at 25 years old who still have this reflex that's going on. So what's going on there is that those, we have 72 movement patterns as humans that are embedded in our DNA, and this is confirmed by science, this is not my opinion, and these movement patterns are there to help us um, gain connections with our muscles. 
ultimately the main goal for us as humans is to be able to stand upright and to be able to fight gravity. But to do this, we need to have a real coordination of our entire body. There needs to be synchronicity between our flexors, that's the muscles in the front of our body, and our extensors, that's the muscles in the back of our body. So what ends up happening is that when we're born, a really uh, our brain really has very, very little connections. It's what, what scientists refer to as, as neuroplasticity. And those connections are, are so little that you can see that very, very quickly in the first three years of life, they almost quadruple. And the uh, quadrupling of those connections is going to be based mostly on movement. So movement really is gonna be the precursor that's going to activate the brain. So I wanna show you an image here of, of the brainstem. This is exactly what I'm talking about here. This is a primitive brain. And when we're born, there's only the bottom of the brain that's really electrically active. So that's why you're gonna see really basic movements. This is why a baby can't lift their head up just yet. That's gonna happen very quickly around one, one month and a half to two months old. But when a newborn is born, we have to hold their head and pretty much do everything for them because the only thing that's really active and functioning is the bottom of the brainstem. And at that point, what we're gonna to wanna to do or what the, the role of the primitive reflexes is, is to activate that entire portion here that you see on your screen to ultimately gain connections to the rest of the brain. So I'm not gonna get into the full connections of the brain because it is really a complex system, but I wanna give you a general, a general idea of what really does stimulate that primitive brain. And as you can see here, uh, the, the main, the three main components that are going to serve as a source of stimuli is going to be vestibular, that's gonna be the vestibular system, your inner ear, visual, our eyes, and when we talk about proprioception, that's really gonna be anything that has to do with your skin, with your muscles, and with your joints. Now, all of those components, proprioception, that's like 85% of that information goes right into your brain. Your brain uses this information constant, con constantly and unconsciously in order for you to be able to stand upright. And that's really important because as those connections are forming, you see that you see that bul bulging here, that cerebellum. Well, the cerebellum in Latin Latin is known as the little brain, and without the cerebellum, it's going to be really really hard for any human to develop really fine controlled movements. And the goal of all of these three sensory components is to activate the cerebellum, which then in turn will activate. Uh, create connections to the rest of the brain. So uh, this is what we see here, primitive reflexes, proprioceptive, visual, and vestibular. You have this on your screen. All three components are extremely import important in the integration of primitive reflexes. So really what ends up happening when we're born is that those connections will are, need to be formed. And it's gonna be really important to form those connections in a specific, um, they have a specific sequence. So in order to get the most benefits from these reflexes, it's always beneficial to work with the different segments of the brain, which have, which includes specific movement patterns. And once those movement patterns are integrated, and what I mean by integrated is when I stroke the skin of a baby after six months of age, the baby will no longer reflexively go into flexion. And that will happen for pretty much every single movement pattern until the child has learned to, to has developed those 72 movements to be able to coordinate and walk in an upright uh, posture with cross lateral movement. So again, proprioception, I put the feet here because one of the last reflex to develop is called the Babinski reflex. And the Babinski reflex is basically when you stroke the skin of the foot, the foot goes into extension, uh, goes into extension, and it really should go into flexion when the reflex is fully integrated. But again, when you're a child, these reflexes are not fully integrated. Now, for those of you who want to research about primitive reflexes, there are so many uh, studies out there, they're linking it to ADHD, 
Uh, I know that Dr. Robert Melillo uh, talks a lot about uh, autism, brain imbalances. Um, there's studies out there that are linking ADHD symptoms to primitive reflexes that are not properly integrated, uh, different types of uh, autism. Well, Dr. Melillo will say to you that uh, autism is basically a left brain dominance as far as uh, in, in comparison to the right brain. And what that means really is, is when we look at an adult's brain and we compare it to a newborn brain, um, again, it's gonna go back to those connections. The problem is, is that the right brain is going to be more active at birth. And if the right brain is more active, and the connections go immediately to the left brain. And if there's not enough stimulation on the right side, then we have an imbalance, in, in, which is referred to as a brain imbalance. And that brain imbalance could be linked in some cases to different symptoms. And we could see that the right brain has very specific functions. It's anything that's going to be global. Right, so uh, a 3D shapes, uh, music, art, intuition, creativity, uh, tone, uh, emotions, um, and the left brain is going to be anything that is more very, very, very detailed. But before the left brain kicks in, which is usually three to six years of life, the right brain has to be has to have received the maximum amount of stimulation. So what you'll end up seeing if there's an imbalance of networks between the right brain and the left brain, what you'll end up seeing is retained primitive reflexes. And how will you know? Well, you'll know with asymmetry of body tone, uh, asymmetry of skills, and uh, certainly your child doesn't seem to be developing what probably will strike you as not developing in a, in a specific uh, sequence. They might be hyperactive or pulling tantrums uh, and so on and so forth. We'll get to the details at the, end, uh, at the end of the presentation. But again, right brain is what needs to be stimulated um, uh, anywhere between zero to three years of life. And then the left brain kicks in from three years to uh, six years of life. So the reason um, that the brains develop and the reason that we have two sides, a right brain and a left brain, uh, is because of those uh, primitive reflexes and what's gonna connect those two brains together is a part of the brain called the corpus callus. Once that connectivity is made, we are, made, we are able to walk in a cross, in a control lateral pattern, right arm, left leg, and so on and so forth. So let me show you what an imbalance looks like, for example, in a baby that's just starting how to walk. This is an asymmetry of muscle tone already. You can see that the child is just dragging one leg and is all simply leaning on the other one to get up. And if, although this child is healthy and th there may not, not be any issues with him, uh, he probably has retained primitive reflexes. And the problem with these reflexes is that, is that if they're not integrated, if they are not integrated, we end up um, we end up building different blocks of our foundation on top of those reflexes. So, in other words, if we don't have proper integration, it never corrects itself. We just end up building or adding on layers of movement on top of movement that is already dysfunctional, and what that leads to. Pain is the number one thing, but it also has many other functions because the brain. And certainly the primitive brain is connected to our autonomic functions, to our digestion, and to everything that makes us who we are today. So this is the Pyramid of William and Schellenberg. You can Google this uh, online. Basically, the uh, foundation, the pyramid, talks about a bottom-up approach in the sense that everything starts with sensory at the beginning of life. Tactile, we spoke about that already. That's anything that's touch and proprioception, your muscles, your joints. Vestibular, that's going to be your inner ear. And uh, proprioception, that's more specifically going to be the muscles and joints. Tactile is going to be the skin. Then you have your other senses that are kicking in, taste, uh, sound, visual, and uh, smell, and so on and so forth. Why is this important? It was because unless a child is able to feel their body, 
it's going to be very hard for them. If they can't feel their body, they're not going to be able to feel emotions. And if they can't feel their body, it's going to be hard for them to understand what you're trying to teach them. And teaching them could be something just, you know, teaching them to walk, teaching them to tie their laces, to teaching them to ride a bike, never mind school, because that's going to be a whole uh, other topic. But the bottom line is, is very often there are links with primitive reflexes. And that's really what we see in clinic. And those links are very specific to the symptoms that we're experiencing in clinics. So we work really with the three, with three pillars. Um, we, uh, I call them the uh, three pillars of, of development. And again, it goes back to sensory input. Everything that you see and feel is captured through your sensors of the body, your eyes and the mechanoreceptors. The mechanoreceptors are simply little sensory receptors in your skin, in the deep and uh, in the superficial and deep layer of your skin. And there, these specialized receptors are there to tell your brain if anything's happening on your skin. So they're very, very sensitive. Some are sensitive to one one hundredth millimeter of a stretch in three to twenty four grams of pressure, and they are there. They serve as little antennas to your nervous system. You want to know if you're walking on ice or on sand, or if there's an ant that's crawling on your skin, that's your sensory input. Of course, pain is also involved in there in case you burn yourself and whatnot. The point is, is that your brain uh, is going to grow from this sensory information. Then in order for you to move, there needs to be an integration. And that integration happens. This is the integration it happens with primitive reflexes. Remember that those primitive reflexes are reflexive movements. You cannot control them consciously. And the more you uh, practice the reflex, the more, the more you flex your hand, flex your hand, flex your hand. At some point, your brain is going to learn this movement and it's gonna say, oh, we got it. We got the control, we understand what muscles need to be activated in order to do this, we can now learn to let go and contract, or I should say activate our extensors in order to let go of our hand. And these reflexes, again, happen in a different sequence. They happen ipsilaterally, homolaterally, ipsilaterally, which is on the same side of, of your body and contralaterally, and they happen in a specific sequence. So once this integration is made, it's only at this point that you can start moving. Uh, once the brain knows what your intent is, then it's going to send the command to your muscles to move. And for me, that really is, uh, you know, including this three pillar approach is really, um, is really a way to be able to identify exactly where the problem is and to be able to uh, come up with a, a therapeutic plan in order to address, to address the problems that you're seeing. So ultimately here is the goal. The goal is the activation of this part of the brain, which is called the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is not electrically active at birth. When the baby is born, the frontal lobe is, is there, but the connections to the frontal lobe are not built yet. What's going to build those connections is going to be primitive reflexes, sensory information, and movement. Most importantly, movement. Now, the, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal lobe, but which is part of the front of lobe, uh, frontal lobe, is what is unique to humans. What compares a baby to an animal? How long does it take for an animal to walk in comparison to a baby? It takes a baby 12 months because they need to gain access to their frontal lobe. And, and the access to the frontal lobe is ultimately what is going to give them upright posture and eventually the ability to think in a reasoned fashion and intellect and, and you know, form the personality that they have, uh, that they have today. So the, the motor cortex, which we don't see here, is, is what moves us. But the motor cortex actually grows out of the sensory cortex. So in other words, the more stimulation you receive as a child, the more you build connections to your motor cortex, the motor strip connects to every single muscle in your body. And that connection then goes to the frontal lobe and it just grows this way, which is what makes us human. So again, this happens in a specific sequence and we'll talk about the different uh, reflexes. And uh, was there any questions, Tanya, or am I, 
my speaking, I'm seeing here that there's a couple of questions that are that are popping in or perfect. So if there's any questions, just let me know. So I hope that that makes sense. I hope that it's not uh, that it's not too complicated. But ultimately, really, this is this is what we want to look for. So what are the what are the signs that are could be associated to retained uh, reflexes? So any behavioral issues such as tantrum. I say one of the first signs really is when the baby is born, if they have a, a hard time latching on. Latching on to feed uh, the breast will be the, the first sign of indication of poor muscle tone. But later on, when they start to grow and, and you know they're three years old, four years old, uh, poor dexterity, poor eye tracking, uh, light and sound uh, sensitivity, motion sickness, hyperactivity, poor posture, poor impulse control, autism, low muscle tone, clumsiness, trouble with coordination, poor body awareness, and they may feel also that there are many more symptoms. I just wanted to give you guys a, um, an idea about disconnection from their own body. And that disconnection fundamentally comes from the fact that their brain, their right brain and their left brain is disconnected. So because, because there's the, the connection didn't happen in, in a specific sequence. So some of the, um, some of the, uh, well, the treatment that we do aims specifically to reconnect the brain hemispheres and to be able to integrate those reflexes before doing so. So the integration of primitive reflexes really will lay the foundation, foundation that is needed for further optimal uh, learning or motor skills uh, that are needed to uh, reach a higher level of learning. And, and it does start with sensory uh, integration. Um, people will say to me, well, what causes this? Uh, anything that has to do, uh, well, birthing trauma will probably, will probably be at the birth is probably the first, uh, the first trigger, uh, whether women are giving birth through cesarean, uh, whether they had a traumatic birth, uh, when the baby is born, if there's not enough movement, lack of movement, if the birth was stressful or if the mother was stressed during birth, uh, illness, injury, viruses could re-trigger uh, primitive reflexes as well. Uh, you may notice this as well if your child had delays in crawling. So a child that does not crawl, uh, that does not crawl or does not walk at 12 months of age and will say, you know, he walked at 14 months and that's not a problem. We know that that's not true. It is a problem and there are going to be consequences the same way that there will be consequences if he walks at eight months as well. He'll be skipping some stages. So, um, and of course, one of the one of the great, greatest problems of the 21st century is the fact that our children now are spending a lot of time on iPads and iPhones and are really not moving as much as certainly as much as we used to when we were kids. And that really is a big problem. So remember that movement activates the brain and without movement. If we stop moving, basically the brain stops getting sensory stimulation and basically it stops to grow. So that's really important. But however, remember that, know that movement, if somebody feels unstable and uncomfortable in their body, if they feel uh, that they're not able to keep their stability, stability and they, that they may fall, they may not want to move or be, um, uh, be susceptible to wanting to move as much as the other kids. Yes, Tanya. Sorry about that, Annette. So we have a question. It says, this is from uh, Doreen. Is there a specific psychological school of thought? Meaning, is this a specific psychological school of thought? And why is this not emphasized in developmental psychology classes is the question. Most of the time, primitive reflexes are looked at for serious neurological disorders like cerebral palsy or any neurological conditions. Uh, orthopedic uh, doctors will, will very quickly scan the baby. But uh, the common thought process is if these reflexes are not integrated, they don't really make a big deal out of it. And uh, we know that that's a mistake. It's a mistake because uh, there are many, many studies that are now confirming links specifically with retained primitive reflexes and a lot of the symptoms that we see nowadays with children. Now, why isn't it, why isn't it implemented? Listen, your guess is as good as mine. Um, I don't know, <laughs> but I do know that I have a lot of references here of, of several doctors and several studies that um, actually do talk about primitive reflexes 
and different types of um, uh, learning, um, uh, certainly the, the, the effects that retained primitive reflexes could have on motor development and, uh, and uh, on movement and uh, ADD, ADHD, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, anything that's under the umbrella of learning disability uh, are certainly, there are many, many studies. But um, going back to the, I hope that that answered your question. So the causes are really related to, to movement. So why would you want to address these reflexes? Um, because it will permit your child to begin to move, to move efficiently. It's going to give them confidence. And uh, as they learn how to move, it's going to activate their brain. It's, uh, it basically, it's neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is simply, you know how we, you know, once you, again, once you repeat a movement and once you learn that movement, you have to repeat it almost 10,000 times for your brain to take that little motor program and say, okay, now we've learned that. And it's going to go right in the middle of your brain in the part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which that's the part that's involved, involved in Parkinson's. So once you start to learn that movement and it becomes yours and you no longer have to repeat it, you're able to just tap into your brain. This is unconscious by the way, and just do the movement very efficiently. But before that happens, you need to feel stable. And stability is the thing that we see uh, that children don't have. So anything that has to do with stability will be affected and anything that has to do with learning and cognition also will be affected. I wanted to put a, a, a graph here of the different reflexes. Keep in mind there's 72 of them. So this is very incomplete but they happen, as you can see, in a specific sequence, two to four months, three to four months, five to six months, and they have a very specific, um, very specific symptoms that would be associated to them if they are not properly integrated. To give you a different perspective would be, uh, would be this graph. So again, the same, some of the same reflexes that we see here. The fear paralysis reflex is a reflex that we that it should not be active by the time we are born. Um, it's probably something you've already seen. You know, when somebody sneaks up behind you and you kind of go like, <gasps> and you have like this reaction like that, that's the fear paralysis reflex. If this reflex is still active in a child, every time that there is a sound that they don't expect, that they hear, any anytime there's a source of stimuli that, that startles them, their autonomic system, their heart rate, and their breathing will actually change because their brain will not know the difference of whether, whether they're in danger or not. So their sympathetic system will immediately kick in. And this is a problem because if they're living their lives with a fear paralysis that is active, then this person is very, very stressed and they, you know, they, may, they may really have a lot of handicaps or a lot of things may be holding them uh, back from, from their development. But one of the reflexes that we will, uh, that we will talk about, uh, the Batkin reflex, I do wanna say something about that. The Batkin reflex is anything that has to do with your mouth. So when you stroke the skin of the mouth in a baby, or even if you touch their hand of a baby, they open their mouth. So the hand is touched, they'll open their mouth to feed. And if you, the rooting reflexes, if you touch their face, they'll open their mouth uh, to, uh, to feed the, the breast. So those reflexes, Babkin and rooting are integrated together. And I'm mentioning this because we see a lot of problems with a teeth eruption orthodontics that's now nowadays that is booming. And very often when there's an issue, I saw Tanya, when there's an issue with the jaw and the development of the mouth, we'll see that there is an active there may be an active rooting reflex or even a Babkin reflex. And another sign of that is, you know, when you write and you stick your tongue out, kind of go like this, that is a Babkin reflex that, that is still active. So if those reflexes are not properly integrated, the entire function of, of the jaw in, in, in its entirety, that's nasal breathing, chewing, swallowing, the development and the eruption of the teeth is going to be affected. Yes, Tanya. Uh, Annette, there's a question in the chat. It says, is there no fear paralysis in early months of infancy? And then the second question was, what is the Moro reflex? I'm getting to the Moro. And for the fear paralysis, is there no fear? What, what was the question? It says, is there no fear paralysis in early months of infancy? Well, there should be. That's normal. However, the fear paralysis should be gone by the time the baby is born. 
Okay, so to recap, the fear paralysis reflex is an ancient reflex that we've inherited, inherited from the time that we were crawling on four like cro crocodiles. We still have it in utero. The, the mother, the, the, the baby in utero still has this reflex, but this reflex should be fully integrated by the time the baby is born. When the baby is born, the reflex that is active is the moral reflex. Yes. So Annette, the person just followed up with a little bit more. I think um, it just says, I'm, I'm familiar with reflex integration. My question is for each reflex, how many times a week do you work on a particular reflex such as ATNR or Babinski? And how long should I start seeing a change? Thank you. Love it. So the treatment <laughs> protocol, <laughs> the treatment protocol that, that we suggest is uh, to work on the reflex anywhere bet between three to five times a day for one minute each time. But it has to be one minute, one minute of quality. So it may take you 20 minutes to teach your child how to actually do the movement. But once they got once they get the movement, they need to repeat it for a period of 60 seconds to a minute and a half three to five times a day. But I, I, I will get to that at the, at the end of the, uh, at the, to give you some tips of, of what exercises to do, to do. And I'll also give you the conclusions that we've seen uh, as far as the results that we have in, in our clinic with uh, children, uh, adults, and, and, even, and even athletes. Uh, was there another question, Tanya? Uh, Annette, are you okay to take another question before we continue? Yes. It says, if I touch my child's chin and she sticks out her tongue, is that a retained babkin? That is a retained reflex. She should not stick out her tongue when you touch her when you touch her cheek. Thank you. So that is a retained reflex, um, and this will affect the the tongue and the development of what they call the stomatognatic system, which is this entire segment here, that entire organ, which basically affects all of our vital functions. For those of you that don't know what the moral reflex is in a baby, this is what this is what it looks like. Okay, so I'll play that again. So basically, the minute that the baby senses that there's a loss of balance or there's a sound or anything that is movement, anything that is sensory, that's not just calming, the baby will automatically go open their arms, go like this and, and start crying. That's normal. But it's not normal for a child to do this or even an, an adult to show to have the same reaction. You know, when they scream, I'm so bad. That's that's that could be that's that could be a moral reflex that's still active in, in an adult. So to test it with a child, you don't have to, you know, it's not very complicated. You just hold the kid and just do a little movement, and you'll immediately see a movement of the arms that open. Look here. <laughs> So we have, we have all of these reflexes. We did an online certification where we have all of, all of those uh, reflexes in slow motion that we test and we show you how to test them and how to integrate them with the different exercises. But I wanted to show you the signs of a retained moral reflex. So once again, if a child or an adult has a, a, a moral reflex that is not integrated, meaning it's still active, very often they may also have hand in hand and fear paralysis reflex. So there's different degrees of how much these reflexes are active uh, and they could be measured in, in, in different ways. But the point is, is that uh, generally speaking, light sensitivity, poor eye control, sensitivity to sound, to touch, uh, they'll be bothered by their clothes on their body, textures uh, will bother them, poor coordination, low stamina, easily angered, anxious, withdraws from others, allergies, decreased energy, low immune system, and much, 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 much more. That's, those are just signs, those are just symptoms of a retained moral reflex. If the moral reflex is not properly integrated, the next reflex that comes after that, the next reflexes that come after that, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, will not be able to uh, develop fully and optimally, but most importantly, symmetrically, symmetrically on both sides of the body if the moral reflex is not integrated. And the moral reflex really is, is one of the first reflexes that need to be integrated and that is active at birth. The asymmetrical tonic neck reflex is, is a reflex that coordinates the movements of the head with the same side of the body as the baby starts to crawl. And then eventually, you know, it's going to develop hand-eye coordination. As the baby starts to move, they're going to look towards their hand. 
So again, every time that there is a barrier, every time that the reflex is not integrated symmetrically, it's going to cause a problem on the level above and so on and so forth. Uh, I pulled this here because uh, this was an interesting study that provides evidence that the age of achieving motor milestones, um, it's written here, may be an important basis for various aspects of later child development. Uh, they compared twins as predictors of later development and basically uh, this is again going back to the integration of primitive reflexes. So, so in conclusion, in order to have gross motor milestones, then you need to start. You need you need to, a child needs to integrate their primitive uh, their primitive reflexes. So, what about an adult? I wanted to show you here a video of a fear paralysis reflex. So, the fear paralysis reflex is a little bit more complicated to test. Um, well, more complicated, not really. It's it's a little different. You have to startle the person. And what I'll be doing here behind this little boy is he doesn't know what I'm doing. Uh, he's, his eyes are closed, his arms are extended, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to clap my hands. And if you pay attention, and this was much more, um, it, it was much more visual when I was there, his entire breathing and heart rate went up. So see if you can hear it here. Let me see if the sound is on. Listen for his breathing. So he's actually panicking there. Okay, so for him, this was a child that was not able to swing. Anything that had to do with vestibular activity uh, caused him fear uh, because the vestibular system is always involved with anxiety and fear. And this is because he had not only a retained moral reflex, but he also had a retained uh, fear paralysis reflex. So um, a simple, a simple test, you know, stand behind your child. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be aggressive or dramatic, but uh, some people can actually pass out from this. If there really is a vagal reaction, they could literally boop, pass out. So, so just be aware of that and be cautious. How do you test this with an adult? Uh, there's a different way to test it with an adult. This is for the moral reflex. We basically ask the, uh, you're standing behind the adult, you ask them to extend their hands, close their eyes and let themselves fall back. Uh, before they do that, their feet has to be together. If they cannot complete the test, then the reflex is active. And certainly if they stop the falling and they do this, that is an active moral reflex. Did you see his arms? So now this is, in, this is, it's too bad that this is not in slow motion, but his arms are gonna go out. So again, there's different, did you see that? So there's different degrees. So this is an active moral reflex in, in, uh, in, um, in an athlete, this was in California. So see these reflexes are continuously, could continuously, uh, could be there at any point, at, at any stages in life and at any age in life. So what, what, how can you integrate this? So the actual reflex becomes the exercise in itself. Do this five to six times a day, perform it for 30 days for one minute each time. So for children, as well as for adults, and there's different varieties, varieties of do, doing these exercises. We ask them, I ask the child to cross over arms and legs ipsilaterally, so right arm, right leg, go in a fetus position, and then open up in a star, and then repeat the same thing on the opposite side. And they can synchronize this movement with inhalation and exhalation. This, this, again, becomes a little bit, there's different degrees of doing this exercise, but certainly by doing, by doing this, this will help the child integrate the reflex. Now, to teach a child coordination to put their right arm and right leg on the same side when the reflex is not integrated, like I said before, it might take you 15 to 20 minutes. So it's, it looks, it might look simple, but for a child that didn't make the connection uh, with their muscles, it, it, it could be really, really challenging for them. So that's why it's really important that parents are patient and that you guys take your time and uh, certainly that you uh, create an environment that is not stressful for the child to be able to learn this reflex. Um, I wanted to talk about now another reflex. I'm going to skip over to the tonic labyrinthine reflex. Where is this reflex here? Just to situate you a little bit here. 
uh, the tonic labyrinthine reflex, which then will develop up to three years. So it's really important that this reflex is integrated. Remember year zero to three, the right brain is developing at its fullest. And that's gonna be with anything that has to do with muscle tone. So someone, you've probably seen people that walk on their toes. They're like toe walkers when they walk or they shake their head. That is an active tonic labyrinthine reflex. If this reflex is not integrated, it's also going to have consequences on your vestibular system. So you may feel dizziness, you may be having anxiety attacks all of a sudden, and you don't know where they're coming from. Of course, they could be triggered by stress as well. So all of these uh, different reflexes, um, maybe all of these symptoms may be linked to the tonic labyrinthine reflex. For children, it helps them to start coordinating their posture, their upright posture, muscle tone, the back muscles, and correct their head alignment and their eyes alignment in regards to the horizon. If it is not integrated, you have the issues on or the symptoms on your screen, uh, anything that has to do with vestibular issues, motion sickness, uh, stiff and jerky movements, they're not going to like doing sports because they feel unstable, toe walkers, we said that before, poor muscle tone, visual speech, auditory balance, coordination, anything that has to do with stability will be impacted if the tonic labyrinthine reflex is still active. So I didn't want to put a, I put an image, a video here of a, of a lady and uh, how to test this reflex. The person is standing here and you simply bring their head into flexion. And what you see is that her whole body goes into flexion. You see that? That's positive. Now, if you bring the head back, you see how she goes into extension? That should not be happening. There should not be any flexion or extension of her body. And look, as I complete and as I continue, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. This is how we know it really is a retained primitive reflex. If you do it and it gets worse and worse and worse, then you really do know that it is uh, that it is stemming from a primitive uh, pr from a primitive reflex. Um, some of the integration for children to integrate this, um, the, the video is not here, would be to basically, uh, could be the cat or even rolling on their back. Any activities that involves the vestibular system will retrain this reflex. But with Posture Pro, we also work with eye exercises and we incorporate those movements with vestibulo-ocular reflex. That's gonna be exercises that include the visual system along with the vestibular system with body coordination. Let me show you an example in session of what that looks like. So we just saw the lady, lady here before that goes into flexion and extension. And then we'll do her, this is approximately 10 minutes later. And we could see that she is now able to control her head posture. I should say her, her head movements on her body. Okay, there's still a little bit of, move, of movement, but it really is, it really is night and day. Um, so some of the things for children that have to be the, the four pillars at this point that have to be addressed and considered when talking about uh, proper development is, is exercise, meaning movement. Yes, Tanya? Sorry. <laughs> Tanya. Tanya, I think you muted, you muted yourself. Sorry, Annette, thank you. I was saying there's a question about, is there an adaptation possible and are there visible improvements with a person who has a multi-handicap? So there's always gonna be, see everybody's brain and nervous system is different. Um, there's, there's always room for improvement and results may be limited when someone has a handicap. I'll give you an example, someone who has a neurological condition like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, we will be able to help, but up to a certain degree and, and results may be limited. Um, but as long as the nervous system is there and we find ways to tap into that nervous system to improve stability and mobility, and uh, work with the vestibular system, uh, there always is room for, for improvement on any stages. I've also worked with people that are completely in a wheelchair, that are completely handicapped, or some that cannot not feel their lower body at all. And, and they uh, have reported feeling a sensation of well being and at least uh, being alleviated of, of some of the symptoms that they're experiencing on, on a daily basis.
But it is it is it is a challenge to uh, do these exercises with with children because parents have to be patient. You have to be present. You have to be patient, and you have to take the time to explain it to them in an orderly uh, fashion. Now movement which is exercises these are the four things that are absolutely crucial for the development of the brain uh, relationship because we uh, build uh, our emotions the environment that we are exposed to and what we live as children and the emotions that we remember remember the right brain will not will remember the emotion but will not remember the detail of that actual situation that's the job of the left brain the left brain has not kicked in yet in the first three years of life so if the child is, is in a very stressful environment then that may uh, play a role on the development of their brain. So emotions, relationships, obviously, if, if they're stressed, they're not going to be able to sleep. And diet, that's a really a, a big one. There are many, many studies out there that confirm that the food that you eat affects your brain. So it's really important to go on, on, you know, on a diet that is clean. I don't like the word diet because it makes it sound like we have to starve ourselves. I'm not talking about starving. I'm talking about eating right, eating clean uh, for the brain in specific cases, right? There's cases if we go through a process that could be a one-year process, it's really important that, um, and that uh, everyone is on board. Now, another thing is the brain is uh, the control center of the immune system. So uh, for example, children with a left brain deficiency uh, can have a lower immune uh, uh, system and uh, bacteria and viruses could latch on to, uh, to different areas like sinuses, lungs, respiratory, uh, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, they can have uh, congestion, uh, their nasal, nasal septum could be congested, making it hard for them to breathe through the nose and then become mouth breathers, which will then have further consequences. Uh, but, and right brain deficiency can put the Im immune system into over, uh, drive, which at this point, uh, the body, uh, the immune system will not be able to defend the body, uh, even in the absence of, uh, of a virus. And, and then this can result into autoimmune conditions like asthma or allergies or whatnot. And this all has to do, this is all linked to the development of the brain, but also the diet will definitely, uh, definitely help in that fashion. Uh, food sensitivities, uh, as well. Well, uh, are involved in this and uh, basically we try to work with a um, you know with a, with a drug-free approach as, as much as we can uh, we work in conjunction with what the doctors uh, recommend but uh, you know a clean eating program that identifies uh, uh, different types of, um, of um, that uh, suggests specific types of food to be added uh, to the diet um, another way to uh, promote movement is anything that has to do with balance, as, as we've said before. I, I put this picture here because the Palmer reflex is one of the, the basic reflexes also that develop at, uh, in, the, in the early stages, of, in, in the first months of life. So when the child is able to walk and they want to, so, you know, all of a sudden they're, they, they become like um, uh, sensory, uh, they, they, they try to create scenarios where they activate their vestibular system or they swing and anything that they will do with their hand will help them develop dexterity. And ultimately dexterity is another function of being human. So uh, crawling, all the different types of crawlings, if you can crawl with your kids when they're babies, it's not too late. You can encourage them when they're newborns and they start to crawl and, you know, at around nine months of age, get on the floor with them, encourage them. If they're three years old, four years old, and they skip the stage of crawling, you can get on the floor with them and make it fun for them and start crawling with them. Anything that involves jumping, core exercises, uh, pulling, uh, climbing, anything that involves vestibular activities will help a child uh, develop their sensory system. Yes, Anya. Um, Annette, this is a very interesting question, which I have to be honest, I'm interested in myself as a principal of a special needs school. The question is, how can we stop a child or student when they head bang um, or have self-injurious uh, activities, especially when they do not feel pain? Well, if they don't feel pain, you need to you you, you know if you need to clear that with a with a doctor because not feeling pain um, that's 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 something that um, you should be able to feel pain. There's an area of the brain that specifically feels pain, so uh, they must feel pain. 
Uh, and how do you stop those activities? Well, why, why are they clumsy or why are they falling? I, I always try to get to the why. Is it because they feel unstable? Is it because somebody pushed them and they're just in a situation where you know, they happen to fall on their head? Uh, one thing is for sure is if you create a system or an environment where the child uh, will be more stable, and we see this with athletes as well because we talk a lot about concussions, um, you know, if, if, if the athlete is going to get is going to get rammed in, into by someone else and you can't avoid uh, the accident or, or the injury, it's always going to be uh, more beneficial if the athlete is aligned be prior to that accident as if they were misaligned. So if their nervous system is primed as much as possible or as optimally as possible before the injury, they tend to recuperate uh, faster. And I would say, I would, I would say that I would go in the same reasoning with, with children, because you can't really avoid children from falling, right? They're going to climb on things and they're going to, and they're going to fall and they're going to roll. So the best thing that you could do is work on their stability. Uh, the more stable they feel, uh, the less likely they are to, they are to fall. Yes. So Annette, there's a follow-up question. It says, I think that if they have low interoception, then they may not necessarily perceive pain the same way a neurotypical uh, child or adult would. Does that make sense? Question mark. So the question is then, should you consult a doctor for that? Well, if they don't feel pain, you should. Yes. Uh, any degree of not feeling pain. Uh, I mean, when you say don't feel pain, if I take a cigarette and I burn them, will they feel it? Right. This is, is that what you're gathering from the question, Tanya, or? Um, somewhat. I'm saying from my perspective as, you know, uh, as, as an educator in a special needs school, often we come across children who are on the autism spectrum or have other diagnoses and often the pain receptor is um, delayed or non-existent. Therefore, the head banging, which is, was sort of the previous question, um, or self-injurious activity, it could be um, hitting, pressing, it could be a combination of head banging. Um, in fact, yeah. the, the pain receptor is either delayed or non-existent yeah. in some of these children. So I guess the questions are coming from, from that angle, if, if I may say. Yeah, so, so again, helping them develop their nervous system. We know with autism, it's a very, very high left brain and very, very low right brain. So kind of, you know, equalizing the synchronicity between the two brains um, and from the research that I've read could, could help up to, a certain, up to a certain point. And again, everybody's brain and nervous system is different. It, it, you want, you want, and certainly if, if active, if primitive, primitive reflexes are still active, it's always going to be more challenging uh, for you to get to the next stage. So, um, you know, we'd have, we'd have to try it and see. And, and uh, if there's something that I haven't tried, I said, you know, if we don't know, let, let's try it. But uh, definitely the not feeling the pain uh, could just be, you know, that uh, I, I would still make sure to check with a doctor just to be on the safe side. And if everything is clear, then I would go, I would go full fledged with, with primitive uh, reflexes and brain integration. Lack of proprioception looks like this. I'm doing these exercises in front of this kid and I want him to touch his nose and his ear at the same time. And now he's getting it a little, a, a little bit more, but at the beginning he's, he's struggling a little bit. So there we have it. So I want to show you when you, when we talk about a multi-sensory system, this is what his eyes look like. This is what his body looks like. This is what his feet looks like. And this is what his jaw looks like. So if all of the sensory organs are already sending um, uneven feedback to the brain, this proprioception here is affected. Vision is affected proprioception from this organ system, which is the jaw. That's just, a, that's, that's an entire system in itself. And you can see that the lower jaw, the tooth here has passed outside and is shifted to the left. This is what we refer to as a crossbite. Um, well, proprioception is one of the, uh, is essential for reconnecting uh, the body and developing the brain. And what you'll see is, is an asynchronicity in movement. Uh, it's a little bit more active over here. This is in a two months span. 
We're asking him to do exactly the same thing, but on the opposite side, touch his nose and his ear at the same time and see here, he actually lost weight. He never practiced the exercise and he's now able to perform, uh, perform the movement uh, as uh, much better than, than at the beginning. And this is through a sensory based approach. Again, another example of, of what it looks like if primitive reflexes are not integrated, if there is an asymmetry of, um, if there is a, a brain disconnection, there will almost always be an asymmetry with the sensory organs. So now we get into the muscular system because it's one thing to look at primitive reflexes in a newborn baby up to the age of 12 months old. But from the moment that that child starts to move and starts to walk and starts to live, you, uh, the muscular system starts to adapt and the tone of the muscle starts to change based on the posture that they have. So if this little boy here has a head tilt and a contralateral body tilt, there is going to be flexion on one side and extension on the other. There is an asymmetry of muscle tone and the child will grow up with that asymmetry of muscle tone. We could already see it in their weight bearing surfaces with their feet. When they get older, we will see exactly the same thing. This is again, a head tilt. We could see that there is the distance between the eyes and the mouth is uneven and there is a tilt. Even the socket is misaligned. You could look at the teeth or already the tongue here is the culprit. So the breathing is impacted. The way that the eyes are tracking is not symmetrical and the weight bearing surfaces on the foot is, is what I call a mixed foot. So as long as the child functions with this type of posture, then the information that is being fed into the brain and the way that the, the child or the toddler is processing that information um, it can, never, um, can never be optimal. These are some of the results that we can get in, in clinic here. We're looking at, uh, these are just, you know, basic postural issues, parents that are coming in just for, for pure prevention, as far as uh, slouched posture, uh, scoliosis. This, this is in three weeks. There's still, you know, there's still something with the scapula, but there's a difference here, even in, in the way that the boy was standing. And, and there was a lot of primitive reflexes. Um, sometimes you can have a few primitive reflexes that are not, um, that are not integrated. So in conclusion, uh, remember to recalibrate your child's brain development for from the ground up. So you have to start from a bottom up approach and anything that you will do to, um, to help with their coordination, whether it be core exercises, body awareness, balance, visual motor skills, hand-eye coordination, or eye-hand coordination, uh, gross body movements, bilateral integration, or even timing or rhythmic uh, movements. You know, uh, if they just time their movement with a sound, we'll work with the cerebellum. And, um, and um, we have, as I showed before, we have some of the references that we've shown here. And, you know, even a Google search, primitive reflexes, you'll have tons of studies that come up on PubMed. And if you, have, um, if you have any questions, I'd love to take them now. And if you think of questions that you'd like to ask us uh, later, you have our information here on the screen. Our website is posturepro.co, info at posturepro.co. And I just wanted to present the team that will be more, that will be present to answer your questions. So we have Jackie, Mara, and Bavini that are there to simplify your life and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and uh, if you haven't done so already, do check us out on our social media platform where we try to be very active because we are in the social media era. And uh, we do post a lot of free tips and, and before and afters and, and, uh, and whatnot uh, on those platforms. So if you have a chance, please check us out. Thank you so much. So thank you, Annette, on behalf of everyone. This is the second time you yes. presented to me and I can't say, uh, I, I can't believe how much more I've learned the second time on, on top of the first time. So for me, it's been a, an amazing experience and I'm sure everyone else is feeling the same, especially from the comments that are coming in. Uh, many people were asking me in private chat if this was going to be available. And the answer is yes, this is being recorded and will be available on our yaldeevolve.com website. Um, so I, I can't thank you enough, Annette, for the time you've taken tonight. It's an extremely informative presentation, and I think it's opened up a lot of eyes, ears, and every other sense and reflex. 
uh, from all the information you've given us. So we are going to open up our official question and answer period. Please feel free to write anything in the chat. Um, Annette, there was a question about, are there any certain OTs who specialize in reflex integration that you are aware of? Uh, in Montreal? The question wasn't specific, but I'm going to assume yes, unless told otherwise. Well, what I would say off the top of my head, if, if uh, I, I, I would not have this information in my head, but if you really would want to know, please send us an email and the girls from the team will be more than happy to di direct you where uh, to, uh, to someone in wherever you are in, in the world, or if you're in Montreal, uh, we'd be more than happy to direct you. We do work, uh, we do work with a lot of uh, different professionals and refer out when, uh, you know, we like to work with this global approach. So uh, we, this is very pluridisciplinary. So if there's anybody else that we can refer to you, we will do so as well. Annette, do you happen to work with any psychomotor therapists? I, I do not personally. Uh, if there is any that you know of, or you may want to suggest, I'd be more than, uh, than happy to, uh, I think they're really important for the process. Like I said, we need to, emotions are involved, posture is involved. Uh, there needs to be many therapists that are, that are involved in the system. It is, it is pluridisciplinary, but at the same time, the reflexes have to be integrated and posture has to be aligned for everything else to be added on. That really is the, the first step. Um, Annette, more specifically, it was actually in the New York area was the question. It was coming from the New York area. I wouldn't know. I would have, the girls would know though. Okay, perfect. So please send us, send us an email. The next question is, can you test or work on the moral reflex on a baby? You can, uh, what, how old? I would have to know how old, but typically with babies, there's different exercises that, that, that you can do with the child. Well, I'll say with a newborn baby, any stimulation of the palms, of the foot, or even of the spinal muscles when the baby is breastfeeding uh, or bottle feeding, if you can already, you know, put a little bit of pressure on their spinal, right along their spinal cord already, that gets them started. How old is the baby? Annette, one years old. Is the moral reflex still integrated at one? Is it not integrated? We would have to know if it's integrated or not. And if it's not, there's any vestibular exercises that you can do. You can put the child on the floor and just kind of rocket them, have them their head go back and forth like this as you bring their body forth and back. That could help integrate the uh, moral reflex. We have videos on this on our uh, online uh, certification called Reflex and Brain Development. You can see that off uh, of our website. Uh, all of those exercises are listed that they're uh, for you in, in detail, but uh, there are exercises that you could do for a one-year-old, absolutely. Um, Annette, there's a question that came in about the uh, primitive reflexes. Uh, are these the same type of symptoms that you would see in Parkinson's and dementia patients? Well, we know that when there's disease or when we age, some of these reflexes may resurface. So with disease, with virus, with stress, with trauma, or just with aging, some of these ref uh, reflexes resurface simply because they're linked to the aging of the brain or the aging of the nervous system. So my answer to that question would be yes. And what I would suggest is if there was, if, if, if we can delay it or at least improve it, uh, then integrating those reflexes and incorpor incorporating them in your daily routine as, as, as we would do anyways, as, as part of our, our healthy lifestyle, for me, uh, I think is, is a great benefit for, for really everybody. Uh, it doesn't have to be Parkinson's or not, but regardless of the age uh, that you are, uh, I think the primitive reflexes are, are certainly stimulation of those reflexes uh, should be done on a daily basis, even if it's not required. Um, Annette, there's a follow-up question to that. It's saying, is Parkinson's or dementia related to an inability of building on the primitive reflexes when that person was a young baby? Oh boy, uh, you know, how, how to know this? I would, not, um, I would not know. I mean, if we think logically, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to answer that question to know if, if this would be the cause of, um, of uh, or if this could be a cause that would lead to Parkinson's disease. But, you know, it's, we know Parkinson's disease is, is hereditary. There is a hereditary gene. And we know that when there's 
If there's primitive reflexes that are not integrated, then it's going to create a postural imbalance. And if there's a postural imbalance, then dopamine receptors are already going to be affected. So with someone who has the Parkinson's genes already in their family, uh, to say officially, I, I, this I could not do, but is there a link? I, I believe that there could be a link. Thank you. There's another question in it that just came in. It says, how does food and taste tie into the reflexes? And they said, I know you touched on this, but maybe you could expand a little further, please. Well, uh, the food that you eat has, a, has an effect on, on the neurotransmitters in your brain. So uh, if those neurotransmitters are affected, then neuroplasticity is, is going to be affected. So if you have a, a diet that is unclean, then uh, and already have a condition in which you know your your nervous system could be impacted. For example, uh, and and if you have unclean uh, nutrition, then at that point you're just you're you're, you're not making the process uh, easier. It has to do with the brain gut axes, and you know whatever bacteria are in your gut will will affect the way the you, the mood really you, the the way that your brain processes uh, information. So uh, nutrition is a really important factor. Plus it has to do also with the regulation of the autonomic system or the, I should say the enteric system, that branch of the autonomic system and the enteric system. So um, uh, eating food that's unclean uh, could potentially um, worsen the situation as far as, far as uh, brain connectivity. They, they followed it up with another question and that it was uh, more specifically, do the retained reflexes cause sensitivity, pickiness, as in picky eaters? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's going to be linked to the rooting reflex and maybe even also the, the babkin reflex. Any, uh, uh, you know, the, there, there's some kids that, that uh, like to eat uh, very, very small pieces of food that are very picky about the texture in their mouth, uh, that have a hard time swallowing. Uh, gag reflex also may be affected. And uh, I was reading a study where the gag reflex was is absent, and I forget what, what's the percentage of, of children. So all of these uh, reflexes are actually regulated by the brainstem, the primitive brain. So, um, and, and most likely always linked to a primitive reflex. So the answer to that question would be yes. Thank you, Annette. There's another question coming in about migraines. It says, uh, you did mention them earlier. What's the main cause of a migraine? And is there any exercises to do that could help? This person has been suffering from migraines since they're nine years old. Is this something related to primitive reflexes? Uh, it could be, but in this, in this specific example, what I've seen clinically uh, is that the migraine is very often on the side of uh, the diverging eyes. So migraines will can either be linked to an eye muscle imbalance, and that would be, if I can pull this up on my screen, an eye muscle imbalance would be this. Whereas one eye is not looking, is not able to track an object in the same fashion as the other eye. And typically what we see with uh, headaches is that the headache, there's different varieties of headache. They can start differently. But if someone tells me, you know, the headache is always on the left side and we have a left diverging eye on the same side, it may be the source of the headache may be coming from the eye. But keep in mind that clenching your teeth on a daily basis uh, can also create headaches, hormone imbalances. That's going to go back to primitive reflexes in the brain. Um, and, uh, and as well, um, yeah, so the eye definitely, and oh, I wanted to say in the first rib. So if you have a subluxation, if the brachial plexus is compressed, and that might also, uh, that might also be a cause of the migraine. It really depends how the migraine starts, which side it's from and, and how it's triggered. But we've had, uh, we've had success with, uh, with, uh, uh, clustered headaches. And we have a testimonial on our, on our YouTube channel with, uh, with one consultation. We, we could see really the eye that's going off and you can hear the testimonial of the, of the young lady. Thank you, Annette. There's a question about what trainings, continuing education courses do you suggest for learning about this topic from a therapist perspective? So if you wanted to learn from, if you wanted to dive into primitive reflexes, then, then I would suggest looking in, into our reflex and brain development. And if you, uh, if you are a therapist and you're looking to dive a little bit more into it and have a, a greater understanding of how this entire system functions, then I would, uh, I would suggest looking into the posture pro method. 
and that that is on our website. Tanya, I just wanted to say to the previous question for the eye exercises, because I forgot to address that. Yes. To correct, to correct this condition, uh, uh, the easiest way for you to see this, I, I would refer to the TED talk that I did. I don't know if you sent out the if you sent out the link. If not, please do. Uh, Tanya, on on the ten minute mark of the TED talk, I demonstrate on, on, on a big screen how to perform the eye exercises. And I would recommend trying those eye exercises to see uh, if it helps with, okay, uh, with your symptoms of headaches. Thanks, Annette. We'll try and uh, connect that to this recording as well. There's another question uh, about the uh, Posture Pro, the program itself. Which primitive reflexes do you cover um, in your, your online program? And would an OT gain practical information about or more about these reflexes uh, not discussed here? Would there be more that they would gain? Yeah, so we go to, through a total of 15 uh, reflexes in the Posture Pro method. In the reflex and brain development, we cover 10. But the difference with the Posture Pro method is that we incorporate them with, with the Posture Pro method, keeping in mind that uh, one of the things that we noticed clinically, and, and that I noticed in practice, which allowed me to, uh, which allowed me to uh, work with uh, or do a presentation with uh, Dr. Malilo, was the fact that I had noticed that by correcting the foot, by addressing the foot, I would see more often than not, I would see reflexes that would be immediately integrated without, without even working on them. And uh, this reasoning, uh, the reasoning behind this is that the, the skin of the foot actually makes it to parts of your brain that help your brain integrate sensory input. And from that perspective, once the brain senses more stability, for some reason, reflexes get, get uh, inhibited. So if you're looking to, uh, look, uh, to learn a more global approach, how to correct the foot, how to work with the eyes, what to look for with the jaw, uh, leg link discrepancy, brain imbalances and primitive reflexes, then that's really, that's really what we dive into in the Posture Pro Method. It's, it really is the cherry with, with the sundae on top. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. So we have another question here about, is there a specific reflex connected to poor sleep, especially in toddlers? Well, yes, the Landau reflex would be more with the with the peeing and, and, and the wiggling if toddlers are still peeing are peeing in bed. Um, but uh, globally, it could be uh, it could be just be primitive reflex. It doesn't have to be a specific one per se. Uh, if reflexes are not integrated, specifically the fear paralysis reflex, your your child may be may be stressed. Um, another thing I would say is mouth breathing. Uh, definitely mouth breathing. We, we can hear babies that are already babies that are snoring already. And, uh, you know, babies and, and toddlers react differently to lack of sleep than in comparison to, to adults. Uh, they express themselves uh, differently uh, through, uh, they may be even showing signs of hyperactivity. So there is an issue with, with tongue posture, with the jaw. You've probably already, already seen it. If there are anything with picky eating, uh, a jaw deformation, teeth uh, eruption, lingual dysfunction, problem with speech, delays with talking, all of that will, can potentially uh, affect breathing or of certainly mouth breathing as well. So it's a question of looking into all of the different possibilities and trying, then trying to make sense of, of, of what you're seeing with the symptoms. Thank you. There's another question, and that going back to the pickiness, the picky eaters, uh, what exercises would you suggest for reflexes to food sensitivity and pickiness? So I would uh, suggest incorporating the rooting reflex and the babkin reflex. Uh, rooting reflex could be done. I'm looking here on, 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 my, on my desk. If you grab a feather or a piece of paper or anything and you kind of, you know, just on the side of there, when the child is standing still, you literally want to tickle them. That would be one uh, exercise. Uh, another one would be to uh, have them work with uh, uh, chewing gum. So they take a gum, they make a little ball, and then with their tongue, they kind of flatten out the, the, the piece of gum on their palate to gain uh, control of, of their tongue. Uh, there's different sounds and exercises that could be done in conjunction with the opening and the closing of the hands. Uh, playing with different little toys that requires that, you know, they develop their, their motor skills. Uh, you could do that with a metronome. There's a variety of, of stuff that, that we work with uh, that could be done with, uh, with pick, picky eating. And, and what we see really are changes. We see changes in occlusion without braces. <laughs> 
so so and and we have I mean I have all of those pictures uh, but but there there are uh, changes that are happening when you change the habits of the tongue and the tongue uh, positions itself on the palate then then you know the jaw changes. So I'm looking at the time here. So just to let everyone know, we'll go for another seven minutes. I'm uh, going to assume, Annette, you are slightly exhausted. I want to thank you for answering all these questions. They're still coming in. Uh, there's another question coming in about the fear paralysis. Is this connected uh, to anxiety, chronic depression? And what exercises would you recommend to be able to help that if, if it is connected? Uh, it is connected. The, uh, the body is in a, in a constant state of stress. So your brain, also, when the fear paralysis, if it's active, your brain thinks that there's, an, uh, that there's a tiger in the room. So combine that with uh, life that's already stressful as it is and add that on top of it. And if there is a postural imbalance, add that on top of it and then add gravity and then add, you know, just everything on top of it, then you may be, you may be exhausted and you may be going through, through anxiety. So the, the answer to that question is, is absolutely. Uh, what types of exercises uh, can you do? And I'm, I'm looking really the exercise for the moral reflex is, is a great exercise. But if you go on my YouTube channel, there, there are many exercises that I've, uh, they're, they're going to be hard to describe on this video, but you can have a visual of them on, on my YouTube channel. And I specifically, I, I detail which exercises to be done. And if you want to dive more detailed, if you want to have a more detailed explanation in slow motion, then I do uh, suggest perhaps uh, investing in the reflex and brain development course. Thank you, Annette. One more question here coming in about the TLR reflex. Is it connected to vertigo? And what exercises would you recommend to help integrate it if it is connected? Uh, it is, uh, it could be, I, I can't say 100% because vertigo may be multifactorial, but uh, very often again with vertigo, what we'll see is a problem with the eyes. It's going to go back to that diverging eye over here, a problem with the eye as well as if the eye is not tracking properly, the vestibular system is not functioning optimally. So if this test over here is positive, and really, I would suggest testing it. This is how you would know. If when you bring your head forward, you can't do this yourself. Somebody has to literally grab your head. You need to relax and you need to let them bring your head into flexion. If your body follows, then, you know, the vestibular system has different canals, the anterior, the transverse and the posterior. And if there's basically, if they're over solicited, the information that's coming in from your, maybe the information coming in from your visual system and your vestibular system is contradictory in your brain doesn't know which information to pick, which then causes dizziness and instability or even motion sickness. So the first thing to do would be to uh, recalibrate your posture. And that's through the Posture Pro method, which we do in clinic. You don't have to take our courses. You can come to our clinic if you're in Montreal. And if you do come, then we'll look to stabilize your structure. And by doing so, by simply by realigning you and, and realigning the head, because we're realigning the body, will have an immediate impact on the vestibular system. Thank you, Annette. Are there any other questions? Annette, and well, I think this is one last question, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, it's, I think, very appropriate for the times. It's related to COVID. So the question is, with COVID uh, right now, what are your expectations for triggering the primitive reflexes in especially expectant mothers um, and their future babies? Well, I mean, again, it's going to go back. Uh, the mother, before the mother is going to give birth, I think that her posture should be aligned so that there's less as, as the least amount of complications as possible during birth. Uh, a woman's pelvis needs to be symmetrical. The only moment a woman's pelvis goes into out flare, which is to push the baby's head out, if this is going to be done through natural birth, uh, is when she's giving birth. However, if the feet are uneven and if the pelvis is in torsion, the pelvis will not be able to out flare. There's gonna be, um, uh, there's gonna be a compression or an unevenness at the sacroiliac joint, which will prevent the movement from happening, hence going into complications and making it a really long and gruesome uh, birthing process. So step one, 
the mother's posture should be addressed, her pelvis, that's step one. Then step two, when the baby is born, um, do as much as you can right from the beginning, skin to skin, breastfeeding as much as you can and work with, the, with, work with the simulation of, of those, you know, that sensory reflexes, the skin, the, the spinal column, the feet, and holding the baby and moving with the baby so that they start feeling vestibular stimulation. Uh, there's also, if you are able to build on the floor, you know, they sell these mats that are, um, uh, what are they called? You could buy them at Canadian Tires. They're like, like kind the of yoga, like, the yoga mats. Yeah, like, like the yoga mats, uh, of course, create a safe environment and have your baby have your baby be there on the floor with you and, and let them crawl and explore the environment and have them touch stuff. You know, the more stuff you put around them, the more you promote movement. Everything that we actually try to stop our children from doing when you think about it is, is actually a mistake. We should do just the opposite. We should create an environment where they can start climbing like monkeys. <laughs> I, know, I know it's crazy, but, but that's, really, that's really what we should do uh, to help them. So this is, what I, this is what I would suggest. That's certainly what I did with my kids. And, and the pregnancy happened under six hours for, for both children with, without epidural and w without any tearing. So, uh, you know, we've seen it. We've worked already with eight women and, and, and midwives and, uh, and the results were really, um, were really uh, uh, beneficial for everyone. So uh, that, would be, that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Annette. So it looks like we are going to wrap up for the evening. The questions were amazing. The feedback has been that the presentation was extremely informative and very, very well received. So thank you, Annette, for all the time you took and for all the questions that you answered. As Annette said, if you have further questions to reach out to her and her team. And as I mentioned, this uh, webinar will be recorded and posted on our yaldeevolve.com website. In addition, uh, Annette, we will be very happy to also put the TED Talk at the 10 minute mark for the eye correction method, which I personally observed and was uh, quite phenomenal. So thanks again, Annette, for all the time you took. Much appreciated. And thank you to everyone who took the time to be with us this evening. Thank you to Yaldi, Tanya. I hope that I, uh, you know, it was a pleasure for me. I hope that it was, the presentation wasn't too complicated. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. We're here to help. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Be safe, be well. Be safe, be well.